Okay, well, thanks for coming, folks, to, uh, I think it's the 14th lecture this year. Um, I'll start out by announcing I got a guest speaker coming next week, uh, Daniel Bohan. I should have brought his book, but uh, he's got a book on growing cannabis, I think, uh, Garden of Peace. Oh, probably made a fool of myself just there, but uh, Daniel will be here to talk about how it's much easier to grow cannabis than a lot of experts would, would claim for those that don't want to put a lot of money into uh, a grow up and the lights and stuff. Uh, Daniel has uh, in some ways perfected the, the means of growing uh, inexpensive cannabis, uh, kind of leading to what I will be coming back to again later even. And so, uh, yeah, today's topic is the economics of legalization and the sort of the economics of cannabis, which uh, I, I should probably qualify myself for a little bit. I'm, I'm not an expert in this per se, but uh, I did actually start university in economics and math. I wanted to become a chartered accountant of all things. And so uh, it's uh, the economics of, of this plant um, and, and the people that work around it is something that in some sense I've you know, kind of formally and informally studied since university because I was dealing hash and mushrooms in university as well and so I, I you know, kind of studied the trade as it were um, by, by living the, in, the, in the trade. But having been trained in economics, you, you as with any you know, degree, you sort of look at the world through a certain lens after you've been kind of drilled in the terminology and the mindset and that happened to me in economics and so now I, I see a lot of the world in terms of supply and demand and that you know that both the, the supply and, and demand need to be met in various markets or it will be unstable and, and prices will go up or, or uh, scarcity will uh, you know, change things so you know, it's something that over the years uh, I've personally seen a very interesting um, change, um, and so uh, there are changes, and and more to come, and and there couldn't be a more fascinating time to to be working in the field, I might say, and uh, I wish I had been able to spend the weekend just researching towards today's topic to have really fresh numbers for you, but uh, it wasn't possible. Um, but there, there are more things happening with the, the economics of cannabis uh, today than ever. And so, uh, yeah, where, where'd even start? <laughs> uh, and so, uh, things here, I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll even uh, start with, with uh, where a conversation was happening earlier in that um, when I was dealing hash in university, um, the price of gold was about you know, 300 or 320 dollars, which was the price of a pound of hash. Um, that we didn't have access to cannabis uh, prohibition, um, didn't allow for that. So there was a, a demand for for these products to be sure, um, but uh, because the supply was so limited, the price was was jacked up pretty high. I think we were selling it to 45 dollars uh, uh, for three and a half grams, um, 50 dollars we didn't know yet. Fifteen dollars a gram, and uh, it was, uh, and and this it was in like 1989 is when I started 1990. So um, that was you know compared to, to beer and certainly cigarettes, uh, you know a lot more expensive than it is now. And uh, it's it's interesting that while you know prohibition hasn't changed much, and the number of people being arrested has you know have been increasing, not quite every year straight up, but you know, more and more people have been arrested, certainly here in Canada it seems, with, with each year in, in the last 25 years. Um, but uh, 
more and more people are using it and more supply seems to be available. Um, and so uh, the, the prices aren't near what they were um, back 25 years ago. I think gold is like three times that price and, and hash is probably half. <laughs> so it's really uh, changed quite a bit. Well, maybe not half, but certainly less. Um, anyhow, um, before I get into legalization, I, I might want to well, yeah, compare it to decriminalization and, and point out some of the differences and, and the flaws in decriminalization, why it's really a temporary measure at best and, and if can be avoided would, would be you know, ideal, as is happening in some places. But um, decriminalization actually has existed in the Netherlands for quite a long time. It's a very strange situation. Most people go to Amsterdam thinking it's legal. Well, that's not quite the, the case. Um, strangely enough, Amsterdam's been able to sign the 1961 con UN Convention on Narcotics and yet not enforce the, the cannabis laws or the, the, the cannabis resin laws um, as well. In the, uh, uh, you know, certainly in Neth Amsterdam, but in, in many places throughout the Netherlands. Um, you know, legal points aside, um, it's a very strange situation where the, the clubs don't actually apparently sell it legally and they're only allowed to have so much in possession and the growers don't actually have licenses to grow there. And so uh, the, the coffee shops apparently, and, and I've not been there, so this is what, what I've heard, that the coffee shops pay taxes on the sales, um, but the growers aren't um, paying taxes um, or you know working in a, in a legal business structure and uh, in, in some ways I understand even the sales happen kind of um, off the counter uh, almost where it's kind of separate from the, the coffee shop in many cases where you buy off a dealer who's kind of given a space in the coffee shop not buying from the actual coffee shop itself like so they've kind of gotten away with with these rules um, for quite a long time and uh, the country has, has benefited tremendously from it in, in all sorts of ways, even though it's not being completely taxed and regulated, um, certainly not enforcing these laws has saved them lots of money. And uh, in, in the Netherlands, um, I'm not sure what the, the crime rates are, the prison rates, but I'm, I'm certain they're, they're much less than in Canada and, and far less than the United States. Um, and so uh, they don't um, waste a lot of, of resources on these things. Um, but uh, people that work in the industry aren't really fully protected either. Um, and so there are some flaws to this system as well. Um, it, it could be better and, and unfortunately um, it seems as though because the growing is, is untaxed and unregulated um, th that um, could, could be done a lot better in a way that would uh, ensure not only product quality for, for everyone um, but also bring the prices down because uh, one of the, the big problems with the situation in Amsterdam as far as I'm concerned is the prices. It's not inexpensive and the quality is, is my understanding less than in British Columbia where you know, prohibition does exist. And so it, it doesn't really make sense. You'd think that they'd have really high quality and at a lower cost but this is where you know prohibition you know really hurts us because by not being able to have the big legal grow operations and being able to use greenhouses, which would be probably the most effective way to grow cannabis in the long run is greenhouses, and the Netherlands would be a perfect place for it, um, but because of all the rules and regulations they can't have you know, these great big gardens or anything like that, at least not that can go public, you know, they might be some of them, but again the scale of them is much less than what would otherwise be possible because uh, there's all sorts of fear of, of revenue agencies and stuff so everything's kept to a smaller scale and you know in some ways it works quite well for the economy because instead of having one or two big companies controlling the industry you've got like dozens of, of smaller kind of mom and pa operations and uh, it's something where you know in a certain sense it, it may actually employ more people in the industry 
but the prices are really inflated compared to what a completely legal and regulated market would would provide and that's why you know there's uh, not really a branding of, of strains or companies providing the strains what we found is a branding of the seed so certain companies are are branding genetics that they've created and they're making those genetics available in different stores as seed companies or strains available in, in, in dispensaries and stuff but you don't really have in, in Amsterdam companies that are known to sell you know their strains in, in multiple dispensaries you know that you'll have a certain strain available again in small amounts like even when you buy it in these uh, stores in, in Amsterdam there's limits on how much you can buy I understand it's something like five grams and you can't buy more than that from from a coffee shop so you you literally got to go from one to the next like you know uh, to, to get an, any kind of quantity uh, they've got funny rules to, to do that but in a way you know again that keeps the prices inflated and uh, m makes it uh, so that uh, Again, you know, there's no big company that's controlling the industry, so it's it's kind of good in that sense. Um, but it, it it's a disproportionate economy as well. And so, you know, well, decriminalization might work in some sense, and if if you consider that to be the non-enforcement of the law, it, it still doesn't create the fully functional um, economy that that can develop. Um, from a completely regulated and, and legal system like is happening in Colorado probably build up towards Colorado because it seems to be right now sort of a, a little utopia that's that's come out of nowhere although Washington State isn't much further behind and shouldn't be forgotten either but uh, yeah um, the situation in, in the Netherlands has, has existed for you know, decades now it's, it's not a new situation um, there is uh, an ebb and flow politically, it seems, um, between how much these coffee shops are tolerated or how close to schools they can be. And certain towns, I, I guess, have um, created different rules to, to kick them out, which seems strange, um, given that generally um, there are no problems associated with people under the influence of cannabis marijuana, um, like unlike alcohol, as we would all know. And so uh, one of the, the benefits of, of legalization that, you know, um, is, is hard to put a, a number on, although it, I guess numbers are starting to come out of Colorado in different ways in, in terms of uh, crash victims and, and stuff, is the savings on health care that would come from the legal use of cannabis. And... Uh, I think that's one of the other things that's really missing in, in Amsterdam is because the supply is limited to getting it off of these smaller producers, the quality of products and the, the product development is, is uh, not fully developed. And so uh, in, in an ironic way here, uh, under Prohibition, we're actually developing a lot more products. Um, you know, in terms of smoked products and edible products and even topical than have been developed under the Netherlands. And uh, I, I think that's for, for a bunch of different funny reasons, but certainly um, because they seem more or less comfortable with the regulatory system, it's, it's kind of funny. They've been the most evolved for a few decades, but they haven't been pushing it. They, if anything, like I say, there's been this ebb and flow within the country in terms of how many are allowed and you know how close to schools or whatever they can be or how, how uh, and so uh, there hasn't been uh, progression much beyond that for example um, there's very little um, when it comes to the medical applications of cannabis happening in Amsterdam or, or the Netherlands um, it seems in part because it's it's available you know recreationally there, there hasn't been uh, a real need to develop medical services for, for people in cannabis because you can get it anyway. Um, you don't have to develop specialized clubs. Um, but what that has meant is that there are no clubs like ours that are really trying to understand and develop medicinal cannabis products that are specific to patients and their needs um, or strains as well, at least not in the Netherlands. That's happening in the industry outside of the Netherlands. Actually, you know, right beside them you got Switzerland, which is a really interesting 
situation because, well, not right beside them, but pretty damn close. Um, uh, Switzerland uh, doesn't have the, the coffee shops, um, but they do have a medical cannabis system um, that is, is a total contrast to Amsterdam. Um, in fact, uh, I believe it was a, a Swiss company that just got um, the fourth license from Health Canada, Bedrocan, to import uh, cannabis from Switzerland because they've got a very developed um, model for uh, supplying cannabis through pharmacies to people that are sick and they're developing a line of products uh, for people to, to use for various medical problems. Um, and so uh, um, Switzerland has, has actually gone in, in a totally different route than, than Amsterdam and, and have created this legal, legitimate medical system that uh, has embraced cannabis and studied it quite a bit. Um, they're really um, leaders in in Europe in that sense, and but they're they're not really keen on the recreational use of it. It, it doesn't seem as though um, there are even any uh, illegal dispensaries like ours. It's obviously, there's language and distance barriers, so I can't say everything that's going on over there. Um, but it seems as though medical cannabis is happening through the state and. Uh, that is uh, much more controlled than the, the free market um, so it's somewhat different than the Canadian system but uh, it is um, you know I, I think a, a paid-for product which I don't think is happening here in Canada yet they don't have a drug identification number for cannabis at this point and it doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon so getting cannabis paid as a prescription drug isn't really happening yet here but I think that's been going on in Switzerland for a few years now and so uh, um, it's uh, something that uh, has been incorporated into the medical system. And for a lot of countries, it seems as though the, the, uh, the, the legalization of, of cannabis, um, while the debate is, is raging on in various levels, is, is happening through the medicalization of cannabis. It's not a term I've created, but that's sort of been... Um, used to describe uh, you know the medicalization term um, the introduction and sort of integration of cannabis uh, into the whole healthcare system and that's huge really um, especially in developed countries like ours but even in undeveloped countries I think the introduction of cannabis as medicine is going to be of huge benefit to people um, in areas that don't have all the, uh, you know, kind of technical uh, skills and equipment that we do. And so um, I'm going to talk about the, the sort of the medical marijuana industry for a bit here because that is really the, the foot in the door when it comes to legalization. And uh, though in Colorado and Washington State, um, we, we see it being legal now. It, it was legal first for medical purposes. Um, and so uh, uh, in Switzerland and, and here in Canada, and, and I believe in, in other European countries as well, um, that will be the direction that we go. Um, in, a, in a very sad uh, note, I, I would suggest that we're not going to see the legalization of cannabis because of human rights issues. Unfortunately, the powers that be in the general public, you know, don't seem to care about uh, m minorities that are being taken advantage of like us. And so the fact that we can have our property taken and, and lose rights and privileges of traveling and stuff, honestly, the general public hasn't seemed to care very much about that. Uh, what the general public has cared about is, is money. And, and so uh, through the uh, you know, growing economic kind of industry of, of the medical use of cannabis, I, I believe we're seeing the gradual legalization of it, you know, human rights issues aside. And so um, the, the thing about legalization though, and uh, medical cannabis as, as well, is that there's many different models that can be considered and, and many ways to do it. And so what I think uh, the world is, is doing now is, is trying to find the best practices. Um, this plant hasn't been available for 
you know, pretty much a, a, a century now in, in medical, um, in, in the medical system. And it's going to be very hard for some in the healthcare industry to really get their head around it and, and incorporate it as, as it should be. Um, but uh, there's a lot of different ways that it could be done. And so here in Canada, uh, what we've we've seen in terms of like economically, um, the government, when they first brought in their health or their program, as, as the courts forced them to, um, and and the courts in Canada here don't actually protect your economic rights. You don't have really economic rights, in, at least not in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, and so. Uh, the, uh, the, the courts have um, allowed access to cannabis and Health Canada's original response was to let people grow their own and start doing research in uh, uh, Flin Flon with the company Prairie Plant Systems. And so a court decision forced them to start uh, or allow Prairie Plant Systems to start selling cannabis because for patients that couldn't grow their own um, or find a designated grower, um, they had no other option but, but essentially the street. And so the courts found that um, uh, unconstitutional and forced Health Canada to start selling cannabis. Um, the court also in that particular decision called the HITSIG decision of 2003 um, also acknowledged that designated growers can be compensated um, above and beyond the cost of the cannabis um, when they're selling it to patients. Before that, it was really unclear and it was sort of implied that for people that got a license to, to grow their own cannabis or get a, a sorry, a designated grower to, to be a, a patient grower, um, it was sort of implied that it should have been done for free. Um, well, the HITSIG decision in Canada here, you know, kind of blew the door open on the matter. and. Uh, while some patients, and really not many because the quality was poor, while some patients uh, s decided to buy it from Prairie Plant Systems, um, the vast majority decided to grow their own or get a designated grower for them. To the point where we're pretty close to 40,000 patients with licenses um, to uh, grow their own cannabis, or sorry, to possess their own cannabis. And uh, I think it's around 18,000 uh, grow licenses in total, either designated growers or uh, personal growers. And so um, that's allowed a lot of patients to grow their own cannabis uh, very inexpensively. Um, there are, uh, you know, quotes of, you know, almost pennies um, per gram uh, that our patients have, have suggested. And it depends a lot of, on how you grow. As, as I said, the speaker we have next week, Daniel Bowen, uh, is going to talk about using you know fluorescent lights and you know regular fertilizer and and how you can grow excellent cannabis with very little economic input. And so, patients have been able to grow their own cannabis, um, which has been wonderful. But still, the the costs um, have been exaggerated. Uh, certainly. Um, in part because of prohibition, um, even though they may have it legally, the rest of us don't. And so um, that has created a, a situation where, um, you know, unfortunately there are bad people in the world um, that would take advantage of anyone if they knew they were growing. And, you know, grow rips, uh, especially in larger cities, are not an uncommon thing. And they're they're not common by any sense, but they can occur, and it's a big fear to anybody that grows their own is that they will be robbed. And so a lot of people that grow their own, especially even people with health Canada licenses, have kept quiet about it once they've got the license. Um, but in the most bizarre ways, the program that Health Canada has created has almost had incentives for these patients to resell what they can't grow them themselves. Um, and I, I say that in part because, you know, while the courts have allowed patients to grow their own cannabis, again, there's no economic compensation for it. And growing cannabis isn't that cheap, uh, depending on how you do it. If you got 
a lot of land and you're living in the country and you can plant a b- bunch in your backyard, well, that's great. Um, some people with the know-how can you know, use simple lights and simple fertilizers and still grow okay medicine, but it still isn't the best, uh, you know, honestly. To, to go really high grade, top quality cannabis, you gotta buy really good lights, you gotta have a good ventilation system, you gotta put a certain amount of money into some high quality fertilizers if you wanna get the best, right? Like, you know, good pot is one thing, but you know, really high quality pot is, is important for patients that are seriously ill, that need this every day, you know, all day, you know, and so, It's expensive to set up all that. Once you're going, it might not cost very much for the electricity and the inputs and stuff, but to actually build the grow room, to get the ventilation correct and everything like that, it does cost a certain amount of money. And if you're good at it, um, with the the plant counts that Health Canada has given out, um, you're more likely than not to grow more than uh, you would need yourself. Now, uh, if we were living in a world where uh, prohibition didn't exist, um, and so the prices weren't inflated out, outside of the medical marijuana system. Um, patients that grew more than they needed would probably, you know, give it away or, or find uh, a good home to, to, you know, give it to. But unfortunately, because prohibition does exist for the rest of us, um, there's a lot of incentive for patients, especially patients on lower income, to sell above and beyond what they don't require themselves. And uh, when the HITSIG decision came down, it, it also sort of um, opened the door for designated growers to, to profit if they could grow more than their patients needed. And uh, it was, you know, kind of, you know, uh, written between the lines that, that, you know, if you're successful in doing so, then, you know, you can sell your access even to a compassion club. A lot of dispensaries across Canada, you know, almost deserve, you know, part of the responsibility of this program coming down in a sense because you know they promoted it as something where the excess could be sold at dispensaries and a lot of dispensaries especially recently have been claiming that it's all grown under MMAR licenses it's all legally grown pot well that means that it's all being resold above and beyond the patients that it was licensed for and uh, so a lot of dispensaries have been really you know kind of um, pushing that end of things in various ways and you know, I believe in overgrowing the government honestly so like the program's stupid and, and in a lot of ways and, and as long as it's illegal for the rest of us it's a distorted market anyway and uh, you know it's uh, you know not uh, our fault for taking advantage of poor you know regulations by Health Canada um, you know honestly giving out these licenses as they did in the first place uh, was irresponsible um, to me the 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 best licensing system that Health Canada could have done if patients are allowed to grow their own, and they should be. But um, there are some concerns, you know, in some sense we would have to say legitimate concerns brought forward by uh, health and safety experts, um, those being fire and mold. And so um, I would suggest that the best model would be akin to driving a car, okay? Um, In order to drive a car down the street, you need to have done two things. You need to have gotten your car insured, which requires an inspection. That inspection, in the case of a grow-op, would be to ensure that there's proper ventilation and that the electrical work's done properly and it's not just going to burn the place down. Not much more than that, really, would have to be done in an inspection, but that would be hopefully sufficient to guarantee that, you know, the house insurance isn't going to be uh, affected by a grow up but moreover a proper insurance uh, you know regime would also allow for crop insurance and the insurance company would not only want to ensure that it's not going to burn down but also try to assure that your crop is going to go well so that there's incentive if you've got a good insurance company and that kind of relationship for, for them you know as well to make sure that everything goes well I think you know, a premier insurance program should, should allow for that. But just getting your uh, grow room insured, again, shouldn't be all that is required because that doesn't mean you're knowing how to use it properly. And much like getting a car, you should have to just pass a simple test. If you have to, you can take a little course that'll teach you the basics on how to grow 
and that way you know it can be assured that you know you're not going to burn the place down or grow a moldy pot like no one would want you to do that for yourself or or for the public obviously and so it, it wouldn't cost very much for a patient to to you know go through this kind of test and get some insurance and in fact pretty much every patient I've talked to especially if you're talking crop insurance they're all over it you know like that would just be a a wonderful thing for patients to have available to them um, and so uh, the current system hasn't allowed for any of that. The current system, you know, they, they were supposed to have inspectors. Well, they never did. And so, um, you know, all of these grow ops, again, like 18,000 of them across Canada have been allowed to exist without anybody ever coming to make sure that they were wired properly. And horror stories have been constantly in the media of uh, licensed grow ops stealing power. <laughs> or um, obviously, you know, having other uh, problems, um, and uh, it's it's been very unfortunate because, in a way, uh, Health Canada's program, you know, ha has almost allowed for those things to, so that they can turn around and say later, oh, see, look at all these problems. Well, if it would have been regulated better from the beginning, um, we wouldn't have seen those problems. Now, uh, in, in none of Health Canada's stuff have they regulated dispensaries either. And so uh, um, that's created, a, a, I think, a, a problem um, for a lot of reasons, uh, especially when it comes to product development. I kind of touched on this, but um, we're seeing an era where there's more and more products um, available and, and that can be made um, really interesting things. Um, there's a way of using CO2 to extract cannabinoids now. Now they're getting these like CBD e extracted CO2 or CO2 extracted CBD and, and things that uh, I, I'm not fully uh, able to explain even because it's beyond my expertise. Um, but there's water resins that you can make that we're going to hopefully learn to make soon. And um, as we were talking earlier, there's also new new products which you know are called butter, um, uh, and people are doing these dabs. Um, how healthy they are, uh, I, I'm, you know, would would speculate because they're not being made in a way that's regulated, and this comes to again, you know, legalizing these products. Um, a lot of people would like to experiment with concentrates. Um, a lot of what is available uh, on the street or even in dispensaries is made with products like, you know, butane and um, isopropanol might be one of the healthier ways of extracting cannabinoids, um, but uh, certainly camp fuel isn't. And so there's there's a lot of different uh, products that are being made available now and, and more all the time. Um, I've talked a little bit about them in, in comparison to our products in terms of the, the le leftover toxins that can be remain. Um, and uh, those aren't tested at all. And so for patients in the current system here in Canada, um, Having no ability to you know, buy these products in a regulated market means that they have no idea what they're taking in, both in terms of cannabinoid profiles, which is becoming more important, but also in terms of toxin intakes, which I think is, is critical. And so, uh, unfortunately, the, the current system hasn't really allowed for any regulation in, in these things and, and has made all of these products you know, virtually illegal. And so uh, it's it's been quite um, backwards because for a lot of patients using these kinds of concentrates, especially edibly, is a lot healthier than smoking. And uh, smoking is an alternative for a lot of people um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, especially when you start talking about young people. You know, you don't want to start introducing smoking as, as medicine um, if you have a choice, honestly. It should be one of the last resorts if you can introduce cannabis uh, orally or topically um, that is a, a much better means medically speaking for for most patients that don't smoke it already and so uh, the fact that that's not included in in the current uh, system here in Canada is, is a is a great flaw um, but uh, we're one of the very few jurisdictions that's doing that ironically um, throughout the United States, it seems uh, concentrates are 
being made fully legal without uh, any of the fears that our government will spew out in the courtroom. Um, and so uh, the longer, you know, Colorado in particular seems to be just getting a massive amount of attention. Um, yeah, so more of these concentrates and things are becoming available in the United States um, and uh, people's fear of them is, is breaking down. Um, but we, we, you know, I think do need to be careful uh, about them again for health concerns. Uh, which is why I think getting them tested and regulated is, is critically important for patients. Um, and the new system isn't going to do that either. And so uh, that's uh, an important part of, of legalization. Uh, again, especially coming uh, from the, the position that smoking isn't necessarily the, the most attractive social habit for non-smokers. Um, and so we're seeing a, an interesting transition in the use of cannabis right now, where it's it's going from a you know almost entirely recreational um, kind of you know area to to much more of a, a medical use, and uh, <coughs> we really haven't um, haven't even started to explore all the the real potential benefits that could come from that, um, even under this new system. Um, which is uh, a very poor model. And again, you know, we're going to be, I think, experimenting here in Canada and around the world with different models on how to, uh, to grow cannabis. So the, the last model didn't work very well here in Canada for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that, again, like these 18,000 growers or so have, have really taken, uh, or some of them taken advantage of the situation, several thousand really, to the point where actually the price of cannabis has, has gone down. Um, and if you are buying it on the, the kind of the street level, if you know your way around, uh, cannabis can be as little as a thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars a pound right now. Uh, a year ago, it was like two thousand dollars a pound, maybe twenty two, twenty four hundred. Uh, and so, just within a year, the price has plummeted. And the only reason for that has been that this uh, program of Health Canada's has been taken advantage of and people are milking it right at the very end. It's, it's The bubble's going to burst very soon and uh, that uh, supply will, will become limited and, and the prices go back up. Unfortunately, most consumers haven't actually felt this drop in price. Um, it's been sucked up by middlemen who've really seen um, their profit margins getting squeezed over time. Um, it, it's such a funny industry. Um, you know, we're... Uh, we were paying uh, virtually the same amount uh, at the Cannabis Buyers Club, uh, I guess 13 years ago when I got a storefront, um, a as we are now. Our prices there that we pay to the growers are, are actually locked in though, in a way. Um, we don't buy on the open market. We have kind of set prices for growers that have worked with us for a long time. Some, I think we're up to like 15 years for one of our growers actually. So some very long-term relationships around there and so our, our prices haven't really changed in, in a decade while our rent has doubled and you know our um, wages have have increased uh, as well by 50 percent and you know every other cost has increased except for how much the growers are getting for cannabis and that's for a couple reasons certainly strains have improved lights and, and fertilizers and stuff have improved so uh, growers have been producing uh, a little bit more um, you know, for the inputs than, than they used to, um, but they are making less and so are the uh, middlemen, which is why they've really kind of sucked up the profits from this drop in the, the pound price compared to what is being paid on the street. And it's a temporary you know, situation. I'm sure in a year from now we'll be back to where we were, um, if not even worse, because um, as of April 1st, no one's growing their own anymore, at least not with the license. And uh, with the mandatory minimums in place, a lot of people are, are afraid to keep going. So uh, th things will, will change, to be sure. Um, and so uh, on, on the bigger note, you know, though, uh, things could change a lot when Justin Trudeau becomes the next prime minister. And I say when because, damn it, it, it better happen in the next election. Um, how quickly it happens, though, is, is really uh, debatable because he won't be able to come in and do it overnight. 
Um, to my knowledge, the, the entire Liberal Party isn't supporting the position yet. Um, it's more his personal position than the party's position, although we, we should be able to get there. Um, as, as time goes, nothing happens quickly in politics, to be sure, and the young Liberals are really pushing this as well. So, you know, we're really hoping that the entire Liberal Party will embrace this policy, but certainly not all Liberals across Canada have. Um, but uh, how quickly um, and, and even what form of legalization we'll see uh, is up to debate. It won't happen right away. And there's, there's different models of it. Um, the one that we fear is much like what's happening with medical marijuana here, which would be that people can't grow their own and are forced to buy it off of big corporations. Um, that's what they're doing to medical marijuana right now. Um, in part because these companies and the government sees this as a money-making opportunity. Um, having people look after themselves doesn't make anybody money. Um, and so the, the government you know, sees the opportunity to, to stop people from being self-sufficient and are setting up corporations to, to sell. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of money being invested in this new system. Um, there's approximately I think 360 applications that have been put before Health Canada. Um, I'd say you know a million dollars uh, investment is is probably uh, a minimum for most of these companies. There there may be some that have figured out ways to do it for for less than that. Um, maybe as little as half a million for the facility and the paperwork and everything. Um, there's been the odd company. Um, trying to figure out how to just be middlemen so they don't actually have to have a facility they can buy it from some other country and, and import it or even you know just buy it from uh, uh, one licensed producer and, and be like the intermediary to sell to patients um, and so uh, there's uh, a few uh, well certainly quite a few schemers trying to make money off this um, certainly a lot of companies from outside of Canada as well as US companies put 12 million dollars into a facility in southern Ontario um, like I mentioned earlier Bedrocan a Swiss company has, has got a license um, one, one of the four um, and we expect uh, other companies from Colorado are certainly in line um, so we're talking you know millions and, and millions because say if it's a million dollars investment on average and some will be much much more um, that's about $360 million being invested in the medical marijuana industry here in Canada, like right about now. And, and these companies are frothing at the mouth. I think by 2020, they've estimated that the medical cannabis industry will be $1.2 billion here annually. Um, but that's if everybody is buying it from these companies um, and not producing anything themselves or getting it anywhere else. And so... Uh, um, you know these estimates are you know creating a, a bit of a frenzy here in Canada especially you know feeding off of what what's happened in, in Colorado um, and it'll be really interesting to see how they they come up um, some of them are quite intent upon eliminating the competition uh, one of them uh, Medigene is going to be giving part of their proceeds to the dare program because they want to make sure that all non-medical users are punished um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really and, and it's really ironic because the Dare program tells children that cannabis has no medicinal value, and they'll be paying for that rhetoric by selling medical cannabis. Um, but uh, yeah, so some of these companies are are really quite ruthless, and uh, it's it's going to be scary. Um, but it wouldn't be so much if patients are able to grow their own. And there is an injunction being filed by John Conroy here in Canada, so patients can hopefully keep growing their own. In which case, this new economic system of the governments wouldn't be such a bad thing. It's much better than the monopoly that prairie plant systems had before. So hopefully, <coughs> hopefully the competition uh, inherent in this new system will bring prices down and quality up. You know, that's a real hope that many of us have. Uh, but it shouldn't come at the cost of patients being able to grow their own. And so we're really hoping that the courts can see the wisdom of allowing patients, especially those who have invested the money already, I into growing their own, to continue to do so. And uh, uh, we would hope that any future um, 
schemes or, or plans to legalize by Justin Trudeau would also include people's right to grow their own. Because as long as we're not allowed to grow our own, uh, there's a fight going on. And so uh, we would hope that our, our government would be, be wise enough to, to allow that right away. Um, but that can't be taken for granted. Um, sometimes people in politics think they need to compromise in different ways or they can't sell the legislation to non-users or the general public as it were. And uh, that's been the case certainly in the United States at times when they've done their ballot initiatives. Um, and it's, it's really amazing to see what's happening in the United States. Um, it, it used to be that all the changes were happening uh, through ballot initiatives and like every fall and, and I think in particular every three years there's like a real rush on ballot initiatives um, we collect signatures nowhere near as hard as, as what we had here in British Columbia you know pretty easy in terms of the numbers and stuff to get these ballot initiatives on you can be paid to to go and, and collect signatures and stuff so um, it's, it's quite a bit different and uh, that used to be the way that laws were passing down there now laws are passing through states um, through their House of Representatives. You know, they're passing medical marijuana laws all the time, which is fascinating um, and, and just amazing to see. And, and all different as well. Um, I, I would hesitate to think that there's two states that have got the same uh, medical marijuana laws, for example. There may be similar ones, um, but they all seem to have different nuances. Some, you know, allow dispensaries um, more than others. Um, but uh, they all seem to have subtle differences in how doctors can prescribe them and how growers can grow. And a lot of them allow people to grow their own uh, cannabis. Um, the state of Michigan, for example, I believe there is, the last count I had was something like 28,000 in the state of Michigan um, had medical marijuana licenses. Um, there's uh, yeah, quite, quite a few patients down there um, that have got the right to, to grow. And uh, certainly um, that changed a lot when Colorado and Washington State made it outright legal for recreational purposes last year. Um, it seems as though the entire United States is on fire now. There's 1,700 pieces of legislation passed last year in the United States to have to do with medical, recreational, or hemp. And so uh, we, we see a real shift happening down there, and a lot of it a lot of it is about the money. Um, people are uh, obsessed with profit in the United States, and uh, it seems as though you know the Wild West is still alive in, in some ways here. Um, and and uh, it's, it's hard not to use Green Rush as, as a pun, but it, it truly is happening. And Colorado has, has been just a, uh, an amazing situation to watch evolve. Um, my understanding is uh, January 1st, day one, they sold a million dollars worth of cannabis throughout all their stores. And this wasn't through the entire state of Colorado, but um, throughout uh, you know, certainly Denver and, and some of the bigger cities, a million dollars in the first day alone. Um, I'm not sure how many have run out or how they've been able to supply themselves, but within days, some of these stores were talking about you know running out or shutting down temporarily till they could find more supply. Um, I'm not sure how they'd be able to do that without going out of state, honestly. Um, it's not like you can uh, you know, grow this plant uh, overnight. But uh, certainly, um, you know, right from the very beginning, uh, people were talking, A, look at all the money, and B, they weren't talking about all the bodies. Like I said, the, the health care savings in this, I think, will come out over time. Um, but uh, it was very fortunate that there you know, weren't any accidents that first weekend from somebody smoking a joint because it would have been all over the news, but it wasn't. Um, you know, and so uh, everybody's talking about the amount of money. Now that first day, apparently, one of the things about you know, legalizing cannabis that's you know, kind of funny is um, the, the taxes, right? Like you know, everybody sees this as being very lucrative. And because it's been prohibited so long and we're basically accustomed to paying these disproportionate prices, um, it doesn't seem you know, outrageous to, to tax us disproportionately um, in, in a way um, that seems to be what politicians are using as the, the carrot for non-users. So in the United States, in, in Colorado here, 
I'm not sure the exact ratio, but I think it was about um, 25% taxes in Colorado, or it's close to that. So that first day, they made a quarter million dollars in tax revenue for the state of, of Colorado. Um, and that money, you know, would, wouldn't have been included in the state coffers. You know, it's very clearly recognized that that profit would have gone to, you know, kind of criminal deviants like me, I guess, that would have taken the money and done something else with it rather than pay for schools and hospitals and things that the state needs. But right away in the media, you know, you could see, look at all this tax money coming in. This is buying us schools and hospitals. Um, it was uh, seen as a really important, you know, economic influx of, of revenue. And the other numbers that were, were just starting to come in, uh, but, you know, at the end of this month, and certainly as time goes on, will show is tourism. Um, you know, many of us are quite aware of Amsterdam because Amsterdam lets people smoke pot in cafes. But tell you what, these cafes are little. Like, they're not big at all. Um, I've had a lot of people come to our dispensary on Johnson Street here and let me know that our, our club's like twice the size of most of these cafes. Some of the more famous ones might be close to or maybe a little bit bigger. But we're not talking like great big scenes. We're not talking even great herb. Um, we're talking horrible weather, and still Amsterdam is very well known, and, and, and a lot of people go there. Well, Colorado is not Amsterdam, and for American tourists, Colorado is just the most incredible place to go, and it's not quite smack dab in the middle of the country, but uh, for people from, from the eastern or western United States, it's not uh, out of the way to go there, uh, certainly not as far as it, you know Jamaica and the Caribbeans either. And so uh, immediately in Colorado, we saw this massive uh, influx of tourists that I think will be sustained for, for a number of reasons until it's legal everywhere. But certainly for the time being, they got this beautiful climate. You know, Colorado is, is one of the most beautiful uh, states down there, I, I believe, just very friendly people. And, and they got the, the herb. And, and so um, I, I think one of the, the real interesting things coming up, even in, in the near future, that's going to even elevate it to that next level, um, is the, the Super Bowl coming up. And so uh, uh, I would normally don't get excited about that at all, but not only is Denver call, uh, from Colorado in the Super Bowl, but uh, Seattle is facing them, the two cities, the two states going head to head that have legalized cannabis, the, the jokes and, and have, have hit the news quite a bit. But it also has uh, leapt over into politics, and that is, in the NFL, they have strict rules about smoking cannabis. Um, both teams have lost players due to drug offenses this year. Whether it's cannabis or not, they won't admit. But uh, the NHL doesn't test for anything but performance-enhancing drugs. Even the Olympics has lightened up their attitude towards cannabis. But the NFL hasn't, and this Super Bowl uh, could be what you know kind of forces this topic uh, into the light and makes it so that NFL players don't have to worry whether they're you know using cannabis or not, whether you know whether that's because it's in their home state or they're visiting a home state and it's legal then. And so um, when we start seeing you know the, uh, the the legalization of cannabis in Colorado, you know affecting policies in you know, sports leagues and in, in other areas far beyond their jurisdiction, you know, the, the changes are just going to keep having this, this rippling effect. And uh, it's, it's really quite wonderful to see. You know, in the long run, uh, we should see prices go down dramatically um, if these, you know, large-scale operations are allowed to, to grow and, 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 and uh, work uninhibited by anything other than you know, kind of normal uh, economic restraints. Uh, we, we should be seeing uh, the cost of cannabis for you know people on the street. In my opinion, you know, two to three dollars a gram would be very high for really high quality cannabis. Um, extracts, you know, would be available and and quite inexpensive as well. Certainly, a fraction of of what they cost now. Um, and um, these products w would also obviously be available you know in coffee shops and specialty stores in ways that I, I think would 
improve our economies you know far beyond you know just the, the the sale of the actual bud itself which is why this mail order system of health canada is, is just uh, inefficient um and, and uh just backwards way of doing it the human contact that comes with with selling cannabis uh i believe is is one of the more important parts uh, of, of using this product um, and so uh it's it's something that I don't I don't think mail order is going to work very well. I think people are always going to want to go to stores or coffee shops or you know know the people that they're getting it from. But the real you know battle in the long run is going to be you know whether or not we have this corporate takeover uh, and and whether legalization means that just big companies can sell it or whether legalization means that we can legally grow it ourselves and and if we so choose you know, to get into the industry by having a small coffee shop or a better breakfast or, you know, um, something to, you know, or, or a small production facility. You know, it, it would be my hope that people that, that use cannabis um, prefer to buy it off of smaller operations um, that, you know, live closer to home, as it were, rather than buy it off of big corporations that are Fortune 500 companies. That choice is, is going to be there in a sense um, between big companies and small. But my hope is that you know, not just with medical cannabis, but with recreational, um, it is uh, um, um, uh, easy market to enter into. And that's where you know what happens with Justin Trudeau. You know, when he gets elected, uh, the the push will have to be uh, to to allow for access into the market for small. And, and mid-sized companies so that the rules aren't so strict with security and testing and and such that the normal person couldn't get into it. Um, if cannabis is, is legalized for everyone, these security measures, you know, won't have to be uh, written in. You know, there'll be an incentive to make sure that your property is secure. That, that's, that, that should be implied. But, uh, Hopefully, again, the, the government in these new schemes doesn't make the licensing system so expensive that, that you know, the rest of us can't enter into it.